With a new coaching staff in place and John Schneider in complete control, some things have changed roster construction-wise in Seattle, but one troubling trend continues. I'm going to be breaking it all down here on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings 12, this is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. A special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're listening in nearby Leavenworth, Washington, or over in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We greatly appreciate each and every one of you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. The Seahawks have officially kicked off their top 30 visits. I'll have an update on the three reported top 30 visits so far. Some intriguing prospects that will be set to visit the VMAC here in coming days. Plus, a post-free agency roster reset on the offensive side of the football. It's going to be a jam-packed Thursday episode brought your way by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now for your lead story here on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Much has changed this offseason in the Pacific Northwest with the Seattle Seahawks. There's a new head coach in town for the first time since 2009 with Mike McDonald replacing Pete Carroll. John Schneider now in complete control of personnel decisions as the general manager and president of football operations. And we've seen some shifts in the way the Seahawks have handled their roster here in the last few weeks in free agency. Some of the veterans that were let go appeared to be a change in priorities and how the Seahawks were going to be spending their money. They are spending far less on safeties, at least when you don't consider the dead cap hits with Quandre Diggs and Jamal Adams. Some of those things are going to take a couple of years to really sort out on the roster so that the Seahawks can reallocate those funds properly to other positions. At the same time, however, there is one trend that has definitely continued that isn't exactly a positive one, and that is that once again, the Seahawks sat out on the sidelines while all of the top guards went off of the free agent market, and even some of the mid-level starters that would have cost maybe a bargain price, four, five, six million dollars a year. They didn't try to sign any of those players either. And that has been a troubling issue throughout the John Schneider and Pete Carroll era. They just have not prioritized spending money, particularly on the interior offensive line. They've had a different starting center five consecutive seasons in week one. And the guard spot has also been musical chairs. Aside from the fact that Damian Lewis did start each of the last four seasons, was a day one starter, got some experience at both guard positions. But with that exception, they have rotated guys at the other guard spot away from him. It's been musical chairs. There's been players like Gabe Jackson that they've brought in that they paid some money for, but he was at the stage where his knee was giving him issues, wasn't playing well. So that move ultimately didn't pay off for the Seahawks. They have not been willing to spend money. And Josh Schneider made a comment last week on Seattle Sports 710 that guards were often overpaid and overdrafted. And that caught my attention because that's clearly how he has handled this offseason and basically every offseason that he's been in charge of personnel decisions for the Seattle Seahawks. They have very rarely made a splash with their interior offensive line. If they have brought in big names, it's been first round busts like Luke Jokel back in 2017. And of course, that did not work out well. And so far this offseason, the only move that the Seahawks made in their tier offensive line in free agency was bringing in Tremaine Ankrum from the Rams, and he has barely over 100 career snaps under his belt in four seasons, likely going to be a veteran minimum contract. And this has just been the way things have operated in Seattle. Clearly, even with Pete Carroll not in the picture, that is something that's not going to change based on what the Seahawks have done. If you look at the last 10 plus seasons with John Schneider calling the shots go way back to 2013. This is the first season that over the cap began to assemble this data. The Seahawks were actually the number one cap spending team in the NFL for offensive line that year. And even though pro football focus did not give them favorable grades, those who watch that team closely know that the offensive line was pretty rock solid. 
opened up running lanes for Marshawn Lynch. Russell Wilson mitigated some of those issues with his athleticism. So the line ended up paying off. They won the Super Bowl that year. But since that point, they have ranked in the bottom third in the NFL in roster spending and the, on the offensive line on nine of the last 10 seasons. If you count this offseason, right now they're currently ranked 32nd in the NFL in line spending. Some of that's because you get two rookie tackles, a rookie contract for tackles in Abraham Lucas and Charles Cross, but still – they're just not spending money at that position. And the results speak for themselves. If you look at pro football focuses grades, they have very rarely in pass protection been in the top 20, let alone the top 10. This has been a line that has consistently struggled to protect the quarterback. And even in the run blocking department, only one top 10 season when Pete Carroll put so much emphasis on running the football. If you look at ESPN's metrics, some of you may say, well, it's pro football focus. It's not the end all be all. And I would agree on that. There's been times where there have been teams that have graded poorly in the blocking department that I've watched on film and thought, why is this team not in the top 10? There's going to be discrepancies with the way evaluation goes. But ESPN's pass block and run block win rate metrics can also be useful when you're trying to evaluate a line. And sometimes you'll see major differences. In three of the last six years, the Seahawks have had a top 12 pass blocking offensive line according to pass block win rate and in all those seasons they finished no better than 18th in pass block grade for pro football focus so there's different ways that these different outlets evaluate offensive lines and their effectiveness but if you see a pattern where teams struggle in both departments you've probably got an issue and the fact the Seahawks have consistently scored poorly in run block win rate they don't consistently hold blocks, sustain blocks in the line of scrimmage. A lot of the action that happens in the run game is because of the talent in the backfield, not what's happening up front. And that's been a problem with the inconsistency in the run game for several years in a row. They just have not been able to create that push. The line has not performed at a high level consistently, and that's made life tough on the running backs. So the lack of spending, you can look back at 2013 and say, well, PFF, has poor grades even when they were number one. That was a pretty rock-solid offensive line, though. That's how they were able to get to the Super Bowl, and they were able to win that game so convincingly against the Denver Broncos. The O-line was a big part of that Super Bowl run and getting back the next season even when they had to make some major changes on that front line. The other big issue, it's not just spending. It's investment in the guard position from a draft perspective as well. And I think this is something that might be a little concerning when you consider that this year the guard class is one of the best that we have seen in the last 20 to 25 years. There's a ton of talent. There's some blue chippers that would be worth first-round picks. John Schneider, though, last week, again, he said a lot of times these guys are overdrafted. His past data, his past trends suggest that he fully buys that philosophy. He has never picked a guard earlier than third round. You look at the draft picks dating back to 2010. John Moffitt, the highest draft pick that has been made other than Damian Lewis. Both those players were in the top 75. They were third-round picks. A bunch of fourth-rounders, Terry Poole, Mark Lewinsky. You had another third-rounder in Reese Odiambo. Very few of these players actually panned out in Seattle. Mark Lewinsky's ended up having a successful career, but most of that has been away from Seattle. Damian Lewis is the rare success story here. He had four years as a starter, was a serviceable, arguably top 15 caliber guard at times, but he wasn't always consistent either. The jury's out on Anthony Bradford, who got some invaluable experience as a rookie last year, being a fourth round pick, but the majority of these players did not pan out. And most of the guards that ended up having a little bit of success for the Seahawks weren't drafted at that position. James Carpenter was drafted as a tackle in 2011 in the first round, and they had to slide him into guard because he was out of shape. He had injuries, and he struggled on the outside. J.R. Sweezy in that 2012 draft was picked as a defensive tackle, and Tom Cable was the rare experiment that worked out, turned into a quality, quality starting guard. But for the most part, the Seahawks have avoided guards like the play in early rounds. They just haven't picked them. It hasn't been a priority. And so that's a little concerning going towards this draft, considering that that is a major area of strength in this draft class. On one hand, you could say, well, that should mean we can get somebody good with that third round pick that we still have remaining. Or if we trade down at the same time, when you finally get a chance to get a blue chipper in the first round, have rookie roster control on that player, 
a 50 year option as well. You've got to take advantage of that with the holes that they've got at that position right now. So it's going to be fascinating to see what John Schneider ends up doing. But for those that are wanting to bring in a player like a Jackson Powers Johnson or a Graham Barton, that's likely going to be going to the first round and will be best suited to play guard at the next level. Uh, don't get your hopes up based on past precedent. And maybe that changes this year. If that's the best player available, it's clearly a huge need for the Seahawks, but Josh Schneider just has not been willing to invest money or draft picks into those positions for better or worse. In this case, he's sticking with that philosophy for now. And so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening when we get to the draft next month. Coming up next, going to look at a roster reset. We are at the end of free agency for the most part. There will be a few signings here out from here on out for teams, but the big moves have happened. I'm going to look at the offensive depth chart to see where things stand for the Seahawks as we draw close to the draft and the start of OTAs in year one under Mike McDonald. Don't go away. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney with March Madness officially underway. Whether you're betting on a big upset like a 16 seed, such as Fairly Dickinson last year, or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Whether you think it's going to be a blue blood like North Carolina or a Cinderella such as St. Mary's, all options are on the table at your fingertips. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. Free agency is still underway. Teams are making signings, not at near the rate we saw a week ago, but for the most part, the major activity in free agency is done, especially for the Seahawks, who have seen their ample cap space dry up to next to nothing especially with a flurry of moves early this week. We'll see a few more roster moves before everything's said and done, a few more signings. We could see some after the draft as well. We see that every year from teams, particularly the Seahawks. But with that said, the depth chart as it stands right now, at least from a veteran standpoint, I wouldn't expect any significant changes moving forward. So it's time for a post-free agency roster reset. We're going to start at the most important position for the Seahawks, being the quarterback position. Obviously, the big move that was made last week, trading a third-round pick and a fifth-round pick to the Washington Commanders for Sam Howell, a fourth-round pick and a sixth-round pick. It was one of those glorified pick swaps. Seattle still has seven selections. They just moved down 20 to 25 to select. In order to get a young quarterback that started all 17 games for the Commanders last year, threw for almost 4,000 yards, did lead the league in interceptions. At this point, this would seem to me like this is your one-two punch. Geno Smith is clearly going to be the starter. Sam Howell, barring somehow a quarterback slipping into the Seahawks' hands with those limited picks in the first three rounds, I don't see the Seahawks going that direction. So I would expect this is going to be your number one and number two going into OTAs and eventually training camp. Howell isn't going to get that opportunity, according to Schneider, to compete against Geno Smith and go for the starting job, at least at this point. But they're going to give him a lot of reps. They want to see what they have in the former North Carolina star. And as for running back, DJ Dallas is heading to Arizona, but the rest of this group is intact. They believe Kenny McIntosh has a chance to fill that void left by Dallas as a special teams at third down back. They also brought back Bryant Kobach on a future reserve deal. Kobach was impressive when he was healthy last preseason, but wasn't good enough to make the roster with four really solid backs already on the team. And they also liked what they saw from Sir Roderick Thompson as well. So Kobach bounced on and off the practice squad with the Seahawks during the season. He'll get another opportunity here. I would anticipate, and I know this isn't what 12s want to hear, it's not going to be early in the draft if the Seahawks use a running back or pick a running back on a pick early, then there is a major problem after picking one in the second round each of the last two years. But I would anticipate in the later rounds that they're probably going to be looking to add somebody else because that is a position where it's never too much depth with the injuries that you see at that position. And they need to help fill DJ Dallas's 
departure. As for the receiver position, this is another spot that hasn't really changed this offseason to this point. You're going to have DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett at his contract restructured. Jackson Smith and Jigba is going to have really high expectations after a strong finish to his rookie season. And I think the same could be said for Jake Bobo, who is clearly receiver number four for right now. Dariq Young is going to be back in year three, hoping to be healthy after dealing with groin and hernia issues most of last season. And they're going to have D. Eskridge back. They restructured his contract as well. And I know that some fans are to the point where they're ready to move on from D. Eskridge. And I predicted the Seahawks were going to do just that. But as John Schneider explained last week, this is a new coaching staff. And D. Eskridge has always had the physical tools. There's a reason they drafted in the second round. Sub 4-4 speed. He has rare explosiveness, kick return ability. This new coaching staff looked at the player. They looked at the upside, the fact that injuries have been his biggest hindrance. They wanted an opportunity to see if he could turn things around with a new staff. So he's going to get one last chance, final year of his rookie contract to see if he can make an impact, at least on special teams. And maybe with a new offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, they can get some more out of him on offense. But it's going to be tough sledding with the guys that are in front of him, especially Jake Bobo coming back a player that I believe Ryan Grubb has a lot of respect for. His ability as well, watching him at UCLA in the Pac-12. This is going to be a fun group from a talent standpoint to see how Ryan Grubb is able to maximize all the weapons that he has on the outside. I was just talking about the O-line to me. That is easily the biggest issue on this football team because they have not made bolstering that interior offensive line much of a priority. When you look at the depth chart right now, A lot of what is going to happen this season is going to boil down to what the tackles do. Is Charles Cross able to take that big step forward and stay healthy? Can Abraham Lucas bounce back? Last season was an injury marred year. He played in only six games. If both those guys are healthy and they show improvement with new line coach Scott Huff, that is going to be a huge deal for the Seahawks. And they do have a nice insurance policy that can play both tackle spots in George Fant. Stone Forsyth showed some improvement last year. The real concern is the interior, assuming that the tackles stay healthy. You right now don't have a proven starter at either one of the guard positions. Anthony Bradford got a few starts last year, but he's still relatively inexperienced, and he struggled at times in those games. At center, Ola Ola Timmy started one game last year. Evan Brown was the guy. He's now in Arizona. Nick Harris has four career starts in four seasons with the Browns. And Tremaine Ancrum has one start where he played a few snaps and then didn't play the rest of the game. So you're talking about as raw of a group as you're going to find. McClendon Curtis is the other guy there, and he hasn't played an NFL snap to this point. So you're looking at an extremely raw position group with minimal starting experience. And the Seahawks have put themselves in a position where they're going to have to hit on a pick in the draft. And Josh Snyder, as I mentioned earlier, has not been willing to do that early. If there's a year he bucks that trend, this is a really good guard class. But still, you're asking one or two rookies potentially to come in and start for you at the guard positions. Maybe Bradford ends up being the guy at right guard. But they have put themselves in a difficult spot. And Ola Timmy, I have some confidence in him in the center spot. I still believe he can be a quality starter. But again, We've seen one start from him. We've seen limited action. Until he has had a longer sample size, we don't know what to expect from the former fifth-round pick. So there are question marks everywhere at the guard and center positions based on the offseason plan, which it really hasn't seemed like there was a plan. Ankrum is a nice depth piece, but they really needed to add a starter, a veteran starter at that if they were going to let Damian Lewis go and we're going to resign him and they didn't do that. And so I do still think that this is the biggest question mark. It was maybe the second biggest going into free agency. It is now clearly to me standing out like a sore thumb. That is the biggest weakness on this football team on offense, defense, or special teams. And rounding out the depth chart, the tight end position, I like what the Seahawks have done from a sense that Noah Fant bringing him back makes more sense because of the new offensive coordinator and Ryan Grubb. He didn't use tight ends a ton his first year at Washington, but last year, Jack Westover finished third on the team in receptions from the position. They got decent production from Devin Culp as well with somewhat limited opportunities. He was effective. So Ryan Grubb knows how to use athletic tight ends. Noah Fant is going to fit the bill. The Seahawks gave him a contract based on that projection, believing he's going to be a bigger part of this offense. And Farrell Brown, the film definitely matches up. Everything that we've heard from 
Mike DeBate, the Locked On Patriots host, that joined us earlier this week. John Schneider himself talking about this guy being an old soul, a physical player at the line of scrimmage. I like this fit with him replacing Will Disley, and I think there could be more receiving upside there in terms of his ability to stretch the field. He's just a more dynamic athlete than what Will Disley was. The questions now are going to be behind those two guys. Colby Parkinson's gone. Disley is gone. They've got some question marks from a depth perspective. This is a really good tight end draft class. I'd be stunned if they don't pick one to develop behind these players, especially with Farrell Brown being on a one-year deal and now north of 30. Might not be a long-term guy for them at the position, but I expect them to draft a tight end, and they might look to bring in some guys in undrafted ranks that have a fighting chance. Brady Russell's another player they want to look at closely. Tyler Mabry's been around for four years. Had a touchdown in him, one of his few games that he actually played in. So there is some intrigue there with those players, but there's a lot of unknowns. I do like bringing in Farrell Brown, and I think Noah Fan in this system, it made sense to re-sign him. So the tight end spot, not as solidified as it has been the last few years. At the same time, it feels like if they can get one of these quality incoming rookies that doesn't have to start right away and they can let that player develop, eventually take on a bigger role, that this could still be a really solid group, especially in offense where – I don't expect to see as much multi-tight end work in terms of formations in the scheme. I expect to see more three and four wide receiver sets under Ryan Grubb. Maybe not going to be quite as needed to have three real solid tight ends, but at least bring in somebody that you can draft and develop. Up next, it is draft season. Free agency cooling off now. Top 30 visits are taking place across the NFL landscape. We have three reported visits for the Seahawks or players that are expected to visit with the Seahawks at the VMAC. I'm going to dive into all three of those players coming up next year on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. Now for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. What's the first thing you do if you had an extra hour in your day for me? I wish I had a bit more time for painting and creating artwork. The best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. BetterHelp Online Therapy will assess your needs. It can match you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on. That's 10% off your first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash locked on. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. A special thanks to all the 12s that are tuning in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We appreciate each and every one of you. It is now draft season. We are moving away from free agency. It's cooling off. Not a lot of moves after a flurry of deals in the first few days of the league year. Teams are shifting their focus back towards pro days and top 30 visits, which Certainly are not the end-all be-all when it comes to who teams are going to draft, but the Seahawks in recent years especially, those top 30 visits have been telling. Last year they had Devin Witherspoon in town and met with him. At the Combine they met with Zach Charbonnet and a number of other players. So these visits are not something that should be put off to the side lightly. They have definitely been telling in terms of the players that the Seahawks have been drafting in recent seasons. And You go back to the 2022 draft. Boy, Mafe went to Seattle for a top 30 visit. The Seahawks have been drafting a lot of these players that they brought in for visits. Tariq Young being another one. So these are important to keep tabs on. And again, they're top 30 visits. They're called that because there's 30 visits, a maximum of 30 players that can come in. You can do medicals, meet with these players, have a meet with your coaching staff. And so these are definitely key. Let's get to the three that have been reported to this point. And I expect more of these are going to crop up in coming days. But these are the three that I have been able to confirm that have been reported. We'll start with a smaller school prospect coming from UTEP, a player that I certainly am intrigued by. That is Tyrese Knight out of UTEP. And you look at the career numbers. He had a gaudy stat line in four years with the minors. 390 combined tackles, eight and a half sacks, 
four forced fumbles. He goes to the combine, runs a 4'6'4 at 233 pounds. Not the most explosive guy in terms of 40, but he had one of the fastest 10-yard splits, which tells you his ability to accelerate quickly, which I think is crucial at the linebacker position. And one of the things that I really like about this kid, he has played off-ball linebacker. He's also rushed off the edge as an outside linebacker. There's some positional versatility to him. He's also been incredibly inconsistent. He feels like a player that if the right coaching staff can get a hold of him, that there's a lot of tools that you can mold. He, he is a ball of clay that could be molded eventually into a player with enough talent to contribute on defense on Sundays. I think it's going to take some time because there are certainly some bad plays on film. There are times where he ends up taking really poor pursuit angles. You can see at times the instincts aren't necessarily fully tuned in. Even though he's played a lot of snaps, he's moved around, and he's played for a school that hasn't had much of a reputation for developing NFL talent either at UTEP. So uh, he, there's a lot of things that you would put down on your red flags list as far as his football talent that I think is going to drop him into late day three, maybe even being an undrafted player. I anticipate he will get picked just because of the production and certainly a guy that's got some versatility. When he splashed for the minors, though, those are the plays that jump out and make you think this kid has a chance to make it in the NFL, even if he isn't picked early in the draft and he ends up falling to the end of the draft or he goes undrafted. He just has traits and there's enough splash plays where you see him get in the backfield, you see him force fumbles, you see him fly downhill and thump people. There are some inconsistencies to his game. He's going to need refinement. He's going to need coached up, but you see enough raw tools and you see enough playmaking ability to suggest that there's a chance the right coaching staff could mold him. So it's easy to see why the Seahawks are intrigued. I was told they met with him at the Senior Bowl as well. So they have been fine-tuned with this guy throughout the draft process, and they want to take a closer look with a top 30 meeting. Now shifting over to the offensive side of the ball, I've mentioned this the last few episodes. I don't think the Seahawks' chances of drafting a quarterback are very high at this point after trading for Sam Howell. They've got two picks in the first 100 selections. They're going to want to trade back. I don't see one of the QBs they really want being available at 16. Maybe Michael Penix is there. We'll have to wait and see how the quarterbacks fly off the board. But I just don't know that John Schneider is going to be wanting to invest that first round pick with so many other needs that they've got on the roster, wanting to acquire extra picks on day two, hopefully. It's just not lining up. But with that being said, the Seahawks are taking a look at some potential day three and undrafted options. And that started in this top 30 visit with John Reese Plumley, who originally started at Ole Miss and then transferred two years ago to Central Florida, the UCF Knights. And looking at his numbers, he didn't get to 6,000 passing yards in his college career. He was in college for five seasons, but never had more than 2,600 passing yards in a season. So as a passer, you haven't seen the refinement you're looking for from a quarterback prospect, but he does have a baseball background. In fact, he played baseball at Ole Miss and UCF away from playing football. And there was even a story of him changing from his baseball uniform in the spring game at UCF. So this guy is a true dual sport threat, very athletic, had over a thousand rushing yards his freshman season at Ole Miss. He is a dynamic playmaker with the football in his hands. He actually had a year where he caught 19 passes at Ole Miss as well. So there's a lot to be intrigued by from an athletic tool standpoint. He's got a quick release. There is film of him making throws downfield where his outfield arm can be seen throwing the football. There's a lot to like. He just never put everything fully together. He wasn't able to win a starting job at Ole Miss. UCF, he put up decent numbers as far as being a dual threat quarterback, but this would be a player you would be drafting from a projection standpoint, that you look at the physical tools, you look at the athleticism, the fact he did start quite a few games late in his college career. The baseball background, Josh Steiner has always liked multi-sport athletes. This is a guy that I could see the Seahawks taking a flyer on late in the draft, and if he doesn't get picked, then certainly the Seahawks could try to bring him in as a priority free agent, give him some run during OTAs and training camp. He could be their third quarterback. So Reese Plumley is certainly a player that I'm intrigued by late in day three. I wouldn't pick him earlier than that because the passing numbers and the film aren't necessarily there to invest a pick higher than that. But again, another guy, the right coaching staff gets a hold of him. I could see him being better than advertised as a backup developmental quarterback 
in the NFL. This is the most fascinating of the top 30s, though, as far as guys that I could expect to come in early and contribute. And I mentioned the receiver Seattle's bringing back. They're bringing back everybody, even D. Eskridge. But that doesn't mean that they won't draft a receiver if the right player falls to them. And this is one of my personal favorites in this draft class, Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky. There's been some comps out there to Debo Samuel. I don't think he's quite that style of a player, but he does create a ton of havoc with the ball in his hands. Last year, finished fifth in yards after the catch, fourth in yards after the catch per reception. He breaks a lot of arm tackles. He makes guys miss in space. He had over 1,200 receiving yards two years ago for the Hilltoppers. Didn't quite get to 1,000 yards this year in 12 games, but still put up double-digit touchdowns. Not a guy that has shown a lot of ability to win downfield. Some of that's been the scheme, but, man, is he effective and dangerous in the quick passing game. If you're throwing screens to him, his ability to break tackles and then do a lot of damage once the ball is in his hands. It's something that the Seahawks were hoping D. Eskridge was going to provide for them. Jackson Smith and Jigba gave him a little bit of that last year. But Malachi Corley was one of the best gadget players in college football in terms of his ability to just, just get the ball to him and let him go to work. The Seahawks would love to add somebody like that. I expect he's going to be gone in day two, so probably not going to be a fit for the Seahawks necessarily. But in the third round, especially if they're thinking after this year that Tyler Lockett might retire, they might move on. I mean, there's some uncertainty for the future. Sometimes you want to draft a year ahead, and this guy has special teams capabilities and just how dangerous he is. They've seen what Debo Samuel can do. Again, I don't see a direct comp there, but he's that style of a player where you're going to scheme up to try to get the football to him quickly and let him go to work. He can manufacture yardage, which has been something that's been tough for the Seahawks at times, despite the talent they have at the receiver position. So I'm looking at him probably as a day two, early day three selection Really talented player. Drops have been a bit of an issue for him at times, but you can't question the toughness. He, he will make some contested cap catches, his ability to bounce off of tacklers, break arm tackles. There's a lot to like about him on offense and potentially on special teams. They will need to see what his pro day workout looks like. He didn't run at the combine, but this is a guy that I expect is going to put up solid testing numbers as well. Could be on the radar, even if it's a position that clearly is not a present area of need for the Seahawks. As always, you can follow me on X and Threads at Corbin Smith NFL. Make sure to subscribe to Locked On Seahawks on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Coming up on Blue Friday with the NCAA tournament officially kicking off, we're going to unveil our own form of March Madness, looking at Seahawks alumni squads and figure out which school is going to come out on top. Nick Lee and I are going to have a blast. Make sure that you are listening in for a March Madness themed Blue Friday episode. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. 